Nobody starts out to make a bad movie. Nobody. But they happen. Yep. Too um, often. Sometimes even huge projects like Bonfire of the Vanities, top book, number one actor on the planet at the time. Order, I say, order! Everything going for it. Did everybody think it was a slam dunk? No. There was a, a vibe that something wasn't happening or what? Yeah. For once for me, what the hell happened with Bonfire of the Vanities so that I can then put it in perspective of where you are now with this film and go on and talk about it? Well, it's almost the classic Hollywood story, and uh, I, who have always felt that I was sort of outside the system and could uh, always make it work for me, just fell completely uh, vulnerable to it. In 1987, Tom Wolfe's first novel, Bonfire of the Vanities, a 659-page story of ambition, racism, social class, politics, and greed in 1980s New York City, was released to critical and commercial acclaim. It wasn't long before Wolfe was approached to sell the film rights, with Warner Brothers paying Wolfe $750,000 to adapt it into a feature film. Julie Solomon, a then film critic for the Wall Street Journal, wanted to document the adaptation of the novel to film and was granted unprecedented access to the production by director Brian De Palma. Her account would eventually become the book The Devil's Candy, The Anatomy of a Hollywood Fiasco. One of the most widely covered topics in the book describes how De Palma had a difficult relationship with then-rising star Bruce Willis, who was generally disliked by most of the cast and crew due to his inflated ego. I wanted to make this guy uh, a real scumbag you know I wanted I wanted to like I thought this was this would be a great opportunity for me to take a shot at these at, at all these yellow journalists who have been coming after me for the last five or six years and I found that I, that, I, that 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 really wasn't as important to me as as you know getting inside the dynamic of why an intelligent man who knows the difference between right and wrong will still choose to do the wrong thing instead of the right thing there were many controversies related to why Bonfire flopped at the box office. Many felt Tom Hanks was miscast as the main character of Sherman McCoy, who De Palma had shaped into a much more likable character than he had been in the book. At the beginning of this film, I think, the story, Sherman McCoy is, uh, is operating on fumes as far as his moral fiber goes. He has very, <laughs> very low morality. He's got an uh, empty heart and shallow soul. Dry tinder. Well, it's, there you go. Yeah, up in a blaze very quickly. And, and he loses it all, but it's the best possible thing. The movie's tone and energy was more cartoonish than what had been written in the book, and thus the film's translation of the concepts that Wolf was trying to write about were lost in translation. On Wall Street, he's master of the universe. He's a down-and-out reporter. One night, with the wrong girl, he took a wrong turn. And since then, nothing's gone right. I'm going to jail, aren't I? Now, Go get him. one man's misfortune is causing another man's fame. Tom Hanks, Bruce Willis, Melanie Griffith. Just watch the sparks fly. The Bonfire of the Vanities, rated R. Now playing at a theater near you. The reviews were extremely negative upon release. Variety magazine stated, the caricatures are so crude and the revelations so unenlightening of the human condition that the satire is about as socially incisive as an entry in the Police Academy series. Owen Gleiberman of Entertainment Weekly called it one of the most indecently bad movies of the year. Rita Kempley of the Washington Post stated, The director has become one with the buffoons Wolf scored in his bestseller. He has not only filed Wolf's teeth but stuck his tail between his legs and went on to call the film a calamity of miscasting and commercial concessions. A less hostile review came from Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. He felt that the viewers who didn't read the novel might be confused by critical parts of the plot and stated the film lacked the psychological depth of Wolf's novel, but at least it does work well in a certain kind of glossy way. De Palma himself has never shied away from accepting responsibility for the critical and commercial failure of the film. And it was my idea as much as anybody's, and I ultimately make the final decision. So you can't say, well, it was the studio, or people were making me do this, or making you do that. It's unfortunate that the film has mostly been forgotten, as one of its best elements is the cinematography by Vilmos Sigmund. The film opens with one of the most complicated and impressive Steadicam shots ever achieved on film. The camera operator, Larry McConkie, had to track backwards, get on a golf cart, ride it for 380 feet, get off it again, track backwards into an elevator, get out of the elevator, and finally track for another 250 feet to achieve the astounding five and a half minute take without any cuts.
It also features an incredible magic hour shot of a real Concorde jet that cost $80,000 to achieve. The shot was orchestrated by second unit director Eric Schwab. Schwab calculated the time and day when a runway at JFK would line up exactly with the setting sun to serve as a backdrop, with only a 30 second window to achieve the right look. He then hired a Concorde jet to take off and land to make sure they had it perfectly in the frame and rolled on the shot with five different cameras. De Palma couldn't care less about achieving the shot and actually lost a $100 bet with Schwab that the shot would even make the final cut. I wonder if I should describe you as the person sort of stoking the flames of this bonfire as a director. Do you sometimes feel like you're building a blaze of something? We tried to build a bonfire that was very hot and yeah. high. And a bonfire has uh, combustible elements, and I guess the contrasts of haves and have-nots and Wall Street and Bronx, that the kind of contrast a director hungers for. Well, it's very dramatic, and when you can bring characters like that in conflict, within a satiric drama, sparks fly. I mean, this was not a, not necessarily a safe choice for me. It was, it, I mean, there were, there were other things that I, that I could have done that I was, that I would have been much more comfortable with or much sure that I would have done a, a good job at. You know, I mean, I think I'm still waiting to hear whether, whether people think I, you know, did a good job in this thing. Over 30 years later, Bonfire of the Vanities is a fascinating misfire, and yet still an entertaining film if one is not going into it looking for a serious drama, but a more animated and over-the-top satire of different societal classes. You don't think things have softened at all, though, do you? <laughs> not judging by this movie. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, are you here to assure us that the kind of satiric thrusts that we saw in those early things, that this is still a sensibility that stayed with you? I think they're very similar to those early things, like Greetings and Hi, Mom, the same satiric thrusts. But how do you keep those fires burning? I mean, how do you keep them from getting banked? That kind well, of Well, society really hasn't changed that much, so I guess the sort of vision of it as a kind of comedic horror show is something that will always work effectively in the cinema.